Good morning, Springs. How's everybody? Hey, uh, we are so excited that you're here. This is the third week of our PG series. And uh, you, just to make sure we were clear on something, if you have elementary age children in the room with you, uh, we were all handed, I think, one of these. P this is a PG-13 uh, service, which means we're going to talk about some topics that you probably don't want them to be a part of, or you're probably going to have a lot more to talk about at lunch than you had planned on. <laughs> so just, uh, we got Springs Kids, great ministry over there, and you can take them there, but I uh, just want to put that out there before we dive in. You know, it was, um, it was in 2006 that uh, there was uh, LifeLock, which was an identity theft protection company, and the co-founder, the CEO, did a multi-million dollar marketing campaign. And I don't know if any of you remember it, but it was uh, him on commercials, on billboards, on trucks, uh, his face. And he believed so much in his company that he posted his own social security number. And he just dared the world to steal his identity. Uh, and they did. <laughs> like 13 different times uh, and that, that, that his name was used to obtain loans and credit and uh, opened up new accounts. And so, and I think it was uh, 2016, uh, he resigned as CEO. And, um, but they're not using that campaign anymore. So it's not a good thing to post your social security number for the world. And actually, uh, on April 8th of this year, there was another data breach that uh, probably a lot of you uh, were involved in. 2.9 billion people's information, including their social security numbers, addresses, names, uh, they were stolen and sold on the dark web for $3.5 million. That's the national public data breach. And uh, identity theft is a term we're all familiar with, and it cost Americans $43 billion last year. But the cost is so much bigger than just the money. See, your identities are possibly for sale on the dark web, but your kids' identities are being stolen by the prince of darkness. And it, this is what I want to talk to you about because our, uh, our kids' generations are facing a critical identity crisis. And it, we have to be very aware that we have an enemy. And Jesus said Satan is a liar. He's the thief. And he, he said he, his purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. And Jesus said, my purpose is to give life and life to the fullest. And, and Jesus has said that he was, he's the way, the truth, and the life. And in, uh, his, with his purpose is like, I, I want to give you life. I want to show you truth. And uh, I've got a book that's on my reading list right now, and I'm looking at... Uh, Life in the Negative World, and it, it talks about uh, the, how the world has drastically changed in the last 10 to 15 years, because up to about 1994, it was a positive world that, you know, uh, that, that Christianity was looked upon positively, and uh, Christian moral norms were still kind of the basic norms of society, but especially in the last 10 to 15 years, it's become a negative world world where society has an overall negative view of Christianity and Christian biblical morality is repudiated and seen as a threat to the new public moral order. That's the world your kids are growing up in. It's not the world you and I grew up in. 
and, but they are. And how do we help them navigate that? And um, here's what I want to do today. I want to ask you to, for something today that I've, I've never done in almost 30 years. I'm going to ask you not to clap today. And the, the reason being is that, you know, I'm going to say some things and some of you are going to agree with me and some of you are going to disagree with me. And, and sometimes clapping can alienate people. It can create division. Let me just give you a simple example. When the president gives his State of the Union speech, you know, you, we, we've all watched it. Whatever president it is, half the chambers are up on their feet clapping, you know, giving a shout every now and then, and the other half are sitting there with scowls on their faces, and, you know, there's nothing united about that room. But so I want to just ask you today uh, just to hold any applause. And as a matter of fact, I will tell you later on in the message when you can clap, okay? <laughs> so uh, there's, but the first thing, we have, to, we have to help our kids find their identity in a negative world that's very different than the world we grew up in. What, first thing I would say is we have to all establish Who's in charge? Who, who's in charge? And I'm not talking about like parental authority. I'm just talking about authority. Who's in charge? Because authority is under attack today. Authority is not trusted. Authority, uh, institutions are not trusted. And, you know, and th there's all the, these reasons. It's under attack. People don't trust authority. And, uh, and when we don't like authority, usually because we don't like somebody else telling us what to do. And, and because of that, we associate authority with rules. And we all know there are dumb rules, right? I mean, we, we all get it. That's why some of you have radar detectors in your cars. Um, and then, and, but, okay, dumb rule. During COVID-19, Publix had a dumb rule, Right? Oh, come on, everybody knows what it was. The one-way aisle. Right, I'm like, big, do not enter. <laughs> you know, and it's like, are you kidding me? But I just have to get the thing. It's five feet inside. And you know what we all did? We just backed down the aisle, made it look like we were. I, that was a dumb rule. But, but you know, our refer, first response to authority is to evaluate the what. What am I being asked to do? What is being required of me? But God says, it's not about the what, it's about the who. See, if I, if I disagree with the what, I can disregard the who. And that's what's happening. It's like, you know what? No, I don't respect authority because it's a dumb rule. It's like the, the first thing you and I have to settle in our lives, who's in charge? Who's in charge of our lives? Who's the authority? God is the author of authority. God put people in authority over you, and God put people under you, and God is the authority of all. And when we get that, it changes how we live. And it's, you know, he's the creator. In Colossians 1, 15 and 16, uh, it says this about Jesus. It says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones and kingdoms and rulers and authorities in the unseen world. Until you and I come under the authority of God in our lives, we will forever be trapped in an identity crisis. It's it, because you're going to build your life. We talked about last week. You're going to build your life on truth or trends. And trends are forever changing. And truth is never changing. And so you've got to decide what is that authority? What are the guardrails of my life? What is the best way to live? And this message is so important for those who are parents of uh, children and students, because there's a war for your students and your kids' identities. And, 
there, there's so much that culture's doing right now to, to kind of raise and train up your children in a way that's moving them away from the ways of God. And the culture is also speaking a lie about your role as a parent. You know, because today, I mean, we, we, we say, you know, we're being told that, well, you're not the only authority in your child's life that uh, others can speak to them and have conversations with them about their gender identity and not tell you about it. And, and we say, you, you don't get the final say. I mean, that's, that, that is, as a parent, one of your most important roles as a mom or dad is to speak that life of identity into your child, who they are. No one knows them better than you. God gave them to you. They are your responsibility. You have to speak who God says they are to them. And, and Jesus said he's the, the way, the truth, and the life. And the truth, he said, that these are the guardrails. I mean, Scripture lays out the guardrails. And, and, and Scripture puts guardrails in your life, not to destroy your life, not to ruin your life, to protect your life and to give you a full life. And that's why it says in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach what is true and make us realize what's wrong in our lives. And uh, so Jesus stepped down into the world and it says in John 1, 14, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. This was radically different than any teacher ever had prior to this. Grace and truth. You see it in the way he interacted with people. You see the way he loved people and the way he led people. He, he, was, he was 100% grace and 100% truth. And, you know, and Paul said we're to speak the truth in love. There, there's a way to say things and a way not to say things. It's like the guy told his girlfriend, when I look at you, and your face, it makes time stand still. And another friend had heard that and he went, I'm going to try that. And he looked at his girlfriend and said, you have a face that would stop a clock. <laughs> yeah. It really matters how you say it, okay? And that's the grace part. It's like, you know what, you got to give truth and grace. And historically, Christians are really famous for truth, but they're really weak on grace. And... Uh, you know, for us, that's one of the reasons we started the Springs, because I, I wanted to start a church that we would reach people who don't go to church, who, who don't know that there's a God that loves them, that, that their life can be changed, and he is, he's not mad at them, he's mad about them. And when, that's, that's was why we started this place, and thousands of people have found Christ here as a result of that. That's what we do, and so today we've got to learn how to balance grace and truth, how to have conversations, and, you know, not arguments. And, and so second thing I would give you, parents, you have to talk with your kids about gender confusion. You have to. You can't avoid this subject you're the one that has to speak into their life. Some of you may feel like, you know, as soon as I say that, gender identity, gender confusion, some of you are saying that. Well, why are we talking about this in church? <laughs> Believe me, I feel the same way. <laughs> it's like there's nothing in seminary that prepared me for a message on gender identity. But, uh, and I, I know some of you feel like when you hear that, you go, why are we getting political? Let me be really clear. We're not getting political. Politics just started messing with morality. And that is what we talk about. So it's, it's that, uh, uh, you know, so let's, let's kind of start with some definitions. Uh, so that we all understand. The definition of the word sex is male or female, typically with reference to chromosomes, internal reproductive anatomy, and external genitals. That's scientific. That, that is a definition. So when somebody is born, 
their sex is identified, not assigned. Like their, their sex is based on their anatomy. And biologists in the entire scientific community actually have a consensus around this. Like, you know, if you're a male, you have a Y chromosome. And no, no matter what you do to your body, that it, no matter what you do to try to change your body, it is that, that is in your, your DNA. It's genetically into every code of every cell in your body. And, you know, and in the past, these two terms, uh, sex and gender identities, have meant the same thing. But over the last 10 to 15 years, there's been the, the strong push for wanting gender to be separated from the concept of sex. And so the definition of gender identity is a person's self-perception of whether they are male or female, masculine or feminine. And so then you have to ask the question, then is gender something that's created for us or is it something that's constructed by us? And uh, in, in the term that we've all heard, LGBTQ, uh, the, the first two letters, uh, LG, are lesbian and gay, but everything beyond that is transgender. And so transgender definition is an umbrella term for many experiences of gender identity that do not align normatively with a person's biological sex. Now, just to kind of set this it, in motion, kind of level set it, uh, there's two, two schools of thought. You can look at life through two lenses through a biblical worldview uh, where we just say, you know what, God and his word are, is the lens that we look through and make decisions through, or you can look through the world's uh, point of view. And you, you've got those two, and it's always been that way. I mean, you read all through the Bible, and they all struggle with those, the, the two worldviews, and, and yet... Uh, there's this constant conflict and the decision you have to make everyone everywhere is does the world override the word of God or does the word of God override the world? It's like, who is the authority? Who's in charge? And see, here's what I mean. Uh, this diagram represents the, the world's view of personhood. There, there's two pieces to it. There's first there's your person, and that's your mind, and, and that, that's kind of like, that's the part of you that really matters, because they say that, that that's a part of you that has moral and legal standing. And then there's the second part, which is your body, and your body, that's a part of you that really doesn't matter, that uh, it's just kind of an expendable biological organism, and you're going to tell it what to do. And so there's two separate and just to be clear, this is what the transgender movement is built upon. Now, you have to understand that God's word has a very different view uh, of personhood and who we are. And uh, it says in Genesis 1:27, for God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. You and I were created in the image of God. Like God said, you're mine. You're mine. It's like you, you in your life, you are, you are not just body. You are body, soul, and spirit. You are, and, in, and the Bible's view of personhood is you are one. You are connected it's, you're created in the image of God. Your body and your soul are connected. Your identity is who you are. And so it says, you know, the Bible affirms what we're talking about over and over again. It said the, uh, that God is the one who created gender and that anything outside of that is outside of the will of God. And that is sin. Very clear, cover to cover. But here's what I want you to know. 
there is no sin in temptation or desire. Like James 1.15 says, desire when it is conceived gives birth to sin. So in other words, there's nothing wrong with you if a temptation exists inside of you. We all have them. We all understand the war that goes on inside of us. Paul writes about it, right? Paul writes about, you know, why do I do the things I don't want to do? And why do I not do the things that I want to do and should do? And what? And there, we get this internal conflict that when we're making decisions and we're wrestling down relationships and we're trying, you know, and, and so that battle, it, we understand the battle. Can you imagine the battle with inside of a person who's struggling with their identity? Like, who, who am I? What is it? And, and so there's nothing wrong with you if a temptation exists inside of you. It's when you act on the desire that it becomes sin. And, and the truth is, if I acted on every desire I ever had in my life, my life would have been a wreck. And... And, you know, Christians have a very high view of the human body as created in the image of God. And think about it. You were born in a body, and Scripture says you were fearfully and wonderfully made by a, by a holy God. Jesus entered into the world in a body. He could have come in a spirit. He came in a body taking on human flesh. And when you believe in Jesus, Scripture says that the Holy Spirit lives in you and your body is a temple of God. And then you, you're going to be resurrected one day in a body. Jesus, when he was resurrected, he was in a body, a physical body. And, and you'll have a heavenly body. So the body is very central to, to Christianity. But here's the thing, there are skyrocketing numbers of Gen Z, 12 to 27 year olds, that are identifying as LGBTQ. And primarily young uh, teenage girls. 10 point, I mean, 28.5% uh, of Gen Z women identify as LGBTQ. And 10.6% of Gen Z men do. Here's the interesting thing. The percentage of people who experience same-sex attraction, the, uh, the L and G, it's like that has remained unchanged for, for years. But what is massively skyrocketing is the transgender movement. And this is the identity crisis I'm talking to you about. See... What the world says is that if your body and your mind feel out of alignment, the world says, listen to your mind and change your body. But the word of God says something totally different. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says, and so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a holy and whole, a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. And don't copy the patterns of, of the behaviors and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think, your mind. And then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and it's pleasing and it's perfect. See, when mind and body are out of alignment, the world says, listen to your mind, change your body. God's word says, embrace your body and renew your mind. It's just, I mean, there is, you know, mind renewal, you think about it, bringing your, our mind into alignment with our body. It's like God says in scripture, come now, let us reason together. Let's work through this. It's kind of like, uh, if, think about it this way. If, if a 100-pound anorexic teenager went to the doctor and told the doctor, Doc, I'm overweight. we got to do something about it. There, there is not a reputable doctor that would look at that teenager and say, okay, you feel like you're overweight? 
Well, let's go ahead and first start you on some diet pills, and then we could do some liposuction, and then we could do some kind of stomach-binding surgery, see if we can get you down a little bit. There isn't a doctor on the planet. Well, there probably is, but there isn't a sane doctor on the planet that would ever do that. A respectable doctor would say, tell me, how, tell me why you feel that way. Let's talk through this. And, and what they're finding out is that stats say that 61 to 88 percent of people will age out of gender confusion if they're just left alone to work through it. In other words, 61 to 88 percent of people who are struggling in their teenage years will age out and they'll identify with their birth sex if you just let them work through it. And, and so it's a let me let me talk to some parents who I know are probably in the thick of this right now. And you got a child who's telling you that they want to make this transition. And you're going to hear some things from people that sound something like this. You have to affirm your child. You have to, because if you don't, they might take their own life. And if they do, do you want to live with that? First of all, let me say this as firmly as I can. That is a lie. All the statistics bear out that the suicide rates are so much higher after a gender-affirming care than when they're going through it. And, and the other thing is this statement, that's emotional terrorism. Who would hold a parent hostage with something like that? It, here's the thing. Acceptance does not mean approval. You could accept somebody, you could love somebody and not approve of their life decisions. So, you know, just, we, we, we're to accept everybody. But, it, you know, and so... Just think, okay, let me, let me shift gears. What do we have to keep doing? More than ever, parents, is keep reminding them of who God says they are. Keep reminding them. And you, you can clap from this point forward, okay? So let's go. Um, but what... You know, the, the Bible speaks of when a person trusts Jesus, they become a new creation. And I love that in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That means at the moment you trust Jesus, you, your life has changed. Who you are, your identity changes in Christ. And that's a... You know, and, and let me just, you know, I want to give you, I want to run through a list because I, it, you might be a parent, grandparent, uh, a student here. You need to know who God says that you are, who he created you to be. I just want to read through some of these and the scripture is in your notes in the Bible app. It'll be on the screen too. But first, you're a child of God. You have been adopted into God's family. God loves you. You've been accepted by him just the way you are. Accepted unconditionally. You, you were chosen by God. Man, you were a first-round draft pick. He chose you. And, it, and you're, you're a treasure of God's. He looks at you. I mean, he loves you, and he's proud of you. And he, you are a treasure to him in his eyes. You're forgiven. The past is the past. Don't you ever let the past define you. Your future is who Christ says that you are. And, and, and you're, you're loved no matter what you've done. You can never do anything to make God love you any less or any more. He loves you. You matter to him. And you're a citizen of heaven. Your home is in heaven. We're passing through, man. And, it, you know, God's said that you're protected by him. You're never alone. No matter where you're walking and what you're doing, God says, I'm always going to be with you. Keep talking to me. And, you know, and you, scripture says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. I mean, you were knit together in your mother's womb. You were created unique. There's not another one like you on the planet, and there never will be. 
you're a part of God's own family. That means you sit at his table. You live in his house. You're, you've, you've been saved from, a, from sin in your life and the, the penalty of it. You, you are blessed beyond measure, more than you could ever imagine, exceedingly abundantly, more than you could ever dream of, Scripture says. You are worth the cross to Jesus. He went to a cross because he loves you. And he paid the penalty for your sin so you wouldn't have to. And then finally, no matter what you're wrestling with, and I know there's so many battles that we face, no matter how you feel today, Scripture says you are a super conqueror in Christ. You are a victor, not a victim. And God has called you to that. You've got to listen. This is who your kids are. You've got to remind them. You've got to love them. Well, I mean, as you're going through the day at mealtime, remind them, tell them, read a scripture to them about what God's, who God says they are. You, you know, when you're laying them down and praying with them at the end of the day, when you're taking them through car line, whatever it is, you've got to keep speaking who they are. And you know what? They're going to grow up and believe it. Let me say this. Uh, no matter where you are and what your thoughts are, uh, this has always been a place of grace. It, it, you know, people matter to God is what we say. It's, it's always been a place that we say, no matter who you are, you're welcome here. And I love that about this place. And I remember having a conversation with a young lady. It was many years ago. Uh, it was after our connect. Like, we're going to have a connect today at 4 o'clock. It was after, after that and conversations. And um, she came up to me and said, I, I'm really struggling with, with something. And I said, okay, what's up? She said, well, uh, I, I've had a lot of girlfriends in the past. I have same-sex attraction, and I, I know what the Bible says about it, and I, but it's been a battle of my life, and I, and I just want to know if I'd be accepted here. She said, you know, I'm, I'm not in a relationship right now, and I would love it maybe if one day God would send a man into my life, but this is a battle in me. And I, I remember looking at her and saying, man, yeah, you'd be accepted here. We're all on a journey. And... Then she told me how she had gotten thrown out of the last church that she was in, and her dad was the pastor. And I saw those tears come up in her eyes, and I just, I just grabbed her by her shoulders, and I said, listen, this is what I'm going to ask you to do. Fall in love with Jesus. Just fall in love with him. Just listen to him. He'll lead you. He'll guide you. And she said, that's what my dad told me. And then she said, could I be baptized here? I said, yes, of course you could. Here's the best part of the story. She was baptized here, but her dad came here and baptized her. And that, I mean, she went on to serve and as leader in ministries, and she'd moved to a different state. But uh, listen, we will never stop loving and accepting and walking with. We, we are all a collection of moral foul-ups. We're just learning to trust Jesus more. And that grace changes lives. But, I, you know, we will always teach God's word. It, this book doesn't change. I mean, this, this is, it's the infallible, inerrant word of God. It's delivered once for the saints for all time. This is the king of all books. This is the book that points the way home and shows us how to live at, while we're headed there. For some of you, you, you haven't chosen God or his word as authority in your life. 
And you could do that today. You could say, you know what? I'm going to settle this. And if you're here today and say, I've never trusted Jesus with my life. I've never asked for him to be the leader and the savior of my life. You could do it right now, right where you sit. Let's go to the Father in prayer. As you bow your heads and close your eyes. If you're here today and you say, I want to begin that relationship with Jesus. Tell him that. You can pray this prayer right where you are and just say, Dear Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for never giving up on me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die on a cross, to pay for my sin, to give me forgiveness, and to give me a home in heaven one day. And today, Jesus, I ask you to be the leader and the Savior of my life. Now teach me how to follow you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.